Hi, I'm Cara Maxwell, and today I'll be reading a short story I've written um, for you. It's titled Dragonflies. <clears throat> Her head is pressed below his chin as they sweep around the hall in slow, great arcs, feet in tandem, heart rates dropped to complement the others. He sings the lyrics slow and sweet to her, and she closes her eyelids to the quiet chaos of the other couples, closes her mind to the sadness of all her world. His hand is rough on hers, skin beginning to wear from time spent under cars. It feels divine. It feels like home. The band plays softly, melting far off into the distance until she can hear only him. She has never seen a dragonfly. There is nowhere for them to live between the pressing, leaning walls of her city. They would suffocate, dropping to their deaths among exhaust fumes and neighbour women, roaring across walls at groups of unwashed, unruly children. They could not leave their young to grow in shallow, oily puddles, smashed to pieces by boot soles and car tires. In that world, delicate things are doomed to fall, to drop like wingless birds from the edge of a nest. He grew up next to bodies of water, wandering in marshlands, running through fields and across ditches. He promises he will show her on the next warm, close evening when they skim along the surface of the water, waltzing in the dying light, romancing one another. When their eyes meet, he gets lost in hers, the shade swallowing him, irises like the rings of a felled oak tree. He can feel his heart in his fingers, in his stomach, in his shoes, buzzing, his pulse thrumming like lace wings, and then like the ticking of a car bomb as they pull up outside her front door. She tells him not to walk her to the porch. The silhouette of her mother is visible through the top window, through the eyelet lace, bun pinned high and tight to her narrow, thick skull. Her narrow skull, thick, yellowing glasses wrenched to her owl eyes, watching, waiting to descend, to pick apart the bones. Jerry could smell the vodka on Marie that morning when she put the cup of tea in front of him. But he waited. He drank his tea, dark, no sugar, scalding, and listened as the radio announced the death of another hunger striker in Long Kesh. He let the tea burn his jaws and his throat to steal him, and then he slapped the mug into the sink, grabbed the child by the collar, and asked him where the bottles were hidden. The child knew better than to lie, and he was tired of it anyway. Marie had been threatening him for months, getting him to refill the drink in the cabinets to their original level, with a funnel and replacement spirits she'd picked up in town behind his father's back. He led his father to his bedroom and pulled back the, th the trim of the sheet to reveal a dozen half-empty bottles, vodka and rum and gin and brandy. They tinkled, knocking together at the force of the door slam behind him, child brought Jerry to the laundry room then, and the bathroom hamper, and the rose bushes growing wild under the window of his bedroom. More bottles. Catching the light like gemstones, the liquid shimmering violently as he yanked them from their tabernacles. Jerry sent the child back inside to collect the drink. He made his son watch as he placed the stopper in the kitchen sink and filled it with all of the rock gut the smell making the child's eyes water. Marie stood to the side sullenly, arms crossed, lips pressed together so hard they were turning bone white. When he was done, he pulled her roughly to the sink by the top of her arm. Pull that fucking plug. Pull it now or I swear to God. He dug his hand into the bloated flesh of her bicep, but she wouldn't give the satisfaction of saying it hurt. The child watched, immersed in the silence between his mother and the plug chain. Finally, she yanked and the plug came free with a bloop, making the child think of jellyfish pulsing through water, sinister and unseen. As the sink emptied, Marie began to howl, 
a keening, shuddering sound that threatened to crack the windows. Jerry stormed out as the drain gurgled, got into his cortina and screeched off, tires marking the grey road, bruising it. How late? It's been well over a month anyway. Shite. Yeah, shite. She is panicking. He can see it on her as she lights one fag off the other, her dark, straight brows knitting together, a storm brewing beneath them. They stay like that for a few minutes, smoking, tense, too far apart. Jerry's mind works fast as his future is suddenly thrown out before him, a father and a husband until the end of his days, a child with his chin and her eyes, her mother rotting away in a rocking chair next to their kitchen range, the evil pissing out from her tear ducts and into their atmosphere to poison them all while they ate meals and prayed and slept and loved. My mother is going to murder me. She is serious, no hyperbole. Marie's mother probably would kill her this time, blind her with a punch to the back of the head or produce the length of barbed wire again and catch her across the legs over and over. Send her to the nuns, maybe. Yeah, that'd be more Bridgie's style. Send her own child to the laundries and smile as her grandchild was dragged from the womb screaming. Maybe we should just run away. No, I suppose not. We'll just have to get married then and tell no one. Tell them the baby was early, hide him for a few weeks. How do you know it'll be a him? Well, she pauses and he watches the corner of her eyes crinkle. I just do. They married in the town cathedral on a Tuesday morning in January 1971. Marie was barely showing, but she chose a loose dress anyway, boxy and off-white, high round collar, the hem grazing just below her knee. That was her something new. She wore her eldest sister's veil, something borrowed, as well as an old pair of shoes and a pair of blue gemmed earrings that had been a 21st birthday gift from Jerry the year before. Jerry wore a blue tie to match. The night before he had scrubbed his hands raw to get the motor grease stains off, but some remained anyway, discoloration on his palms, worn into his cuticles. Marie said she didn't mind, but her mother stared and stared at his fingers while they waited for the priest. Upper lips slightly curled, like the smell of shit was clinging to her nose hairs. Bridgie had shown up in her best funeral garb. Floor-length black skirt, black jumper, big black overcoat, a black hat she'd bought for the day they buried the first of her live-born children to die. A toddler's son with a mass of black hair who caught some sickness of the lungs. She'd gotten her money's worth out of the hat since. She called Jerry back across the steps right before the ceremony, waved a hand to let her daughter know it wasn't her business. He approached her the way one might approach a live wire dangling above a puddle. This is your one chance. I'm telling you, boy, you don't know what you're getting into. Oh, is it? He hadn't the time for her today. Don't take that tone. I'm giving you an out. She's never been right, insolent child, whoring around the town, and now somehow she's pulled herself into it. Nobody will blame you. She's my burden, God help me. She blessed herself. There was a short silence as he tried to put his words together diplomatically, for the sake of their shared interest. He failed. Bridgie, I mean no offence when I say this, right? But pull yourself together, shut your whinge and hole, or fuck off back home to Patrick Street, because you're not doing this to her today. At this, her eyes bulged like she was witnessing the flaying of Pope Paul VI. She clutched her hand to her mouth and sobbed the other hand fingering rosary beads obsessively in the pocket of the coat. Her glasses were glazed with condensation. She was so angry she was literally steaming, he thought. 
he had surprised himself. With the outburst, she had withered, shriveled away like the exposed roots of a weed crisping in the sun. Bridgie marched by him and into the church and threw herself into a pew at the very back, whereupon she dropped to her knees and began a decade of the rosary as loud as she dared. The wedding happened anyway. The wedding happened anyway. They just said their vows a little louder. She thought it would be funny to wrap the entirety of the family's old Ford Cortina in Christmas paper. She was right. A field of prancing reindeer stretched from the bonnet to the boot, expertly sellotaped. Once he got over it, the sh once he got over the shock of it, he laughed so hard his breath hung in great big clouds in front of him, mulling in the frigid December air. She'd gone so far as to the trouble of wrapping the individual windshield wipers. Through the front window, he could see she'd draped tinsel all along the seats and hung baubles from the rearview mirror. The child came out behind him, giddy with the fun of it. Did you have happen to do with this boy? The child shook his head before giggling madly and running back inside, shouting, Mammy, Mammy, we're caught. Marie appeared at the back door, preceded by a big pregnant belly straining against her red pinafore. She hadn't had a drink in two years, not since her mother died. She was smiling really smiling. He hadn't seen her smile like that since the first one was born. He ran to her and tickled her under the armpits until she squealed, breathless, bright peals of joy ringing out from her like church bells. Give over, the child will fall out of me. They sat down together on the back doorstep like two ripe, soft peaches on a low hanging branch, gently leaning towards one another surveying Marie's handiwork once more. She'd even wrap the door handles. Handles and all. Had you nothing better to be doing? Nothing I'd rather be doing anyway. Her scream pierced his sleep like a hypodermic needle through a helium balloon. He found her splayed across the kitchen floor, blood pouring from her forehead, eyes wild and spilling fear across her cheeks. Help me, help me, Jesus, please help me. Jerry was afraid to move her and she couldn't tell him what happened. She didn't know, really. The wine bottle was in smithereens across the back doormat. The light was off. There was a smell of cigarettes. He did the usual checks. He put her flat on her back and tucked his jumper under her head. She was trying to claw him, trying to pull him down, roaring still trying to articulate pain, to tell him where it hurt. Fuck you. Get the fuck off me. Get off me. Fuck off. You want me to die. You want to kill me. You did this to me. He fumbled with the mobile phone, struggled to dial 999. He was not used to the indiscernible flatness of the numbers, the screen cool and slippery under his knobbled, ageing thumbs. He'd have to ask the granddaughter to get him an emergency one with buttons. He held her hand and kept her still while the ambulance sped in from town. The driver was acquainted with the address. He even had himself a regular parking spot. They gave her something to keep her calm so they could strap her to the gurney, held her head still with blocks. She had just had her titanium rods out, he told them. Her back was crumbling on the inside, made of chalk and pastry and marshmallow. She wasn't supposed to be drinking. She wasn't supposed to be walking unaided. She wasn't supposed to be alone. But she always did what she wanted anyway. Well, she always did what she thought she wanted. But what she really wanted was silence. It was painlessness. Some approximation of love or death. They loaded her into the back. She was quiet now. The sedative was quick, straight into the purple, blue, black of her elbow crook. The syringe emptied, exhausted. As the sun sinks, ovoid and sleepy, into the cradle of westward hills, 
He hoists her across a fence, and then another, and another, until they're at the edge of a great pond hidden in a dip in the land. He takes off his jumper and spreads it on the cool grass so she can sit. She drops to her buttocks with thud, her face a little bit flush from the amble, cheeks mirrored in the colour of the horizon. Where are they? Give them a minute. We're a bit early still. Their newly acquired wedding bands catch the last of the shine, reflecting gold onto their clasped fingers. Her stomach is heavy and low. The child has dropped and is getting ready to make a grand entrance any day now. Any day now. The thought exhilarates her and terrifies her all at once. Through her tights, she thumbs the thick, silvery scar at the bottom of one thigh, jagged like a thunderbolt. It still burns her to remember. It makes her wonder what kind of mother she will be. Suddenly, the beating of wings. A cloud descends on the surface of the pond, tails and wingtips skimming the surface like dandelion seeds on a light breeze. Her inhale is sharp and sudden. Delight. Dragonflies circle one another delicately, gracefully looping the pond, the reeds, the hawthorn trees, diffusing, filling the space with sound. His heart gallops at the softening of her shoulders, the wonder on her face. He thinks of the first time he heard a piano playing. He thinks of the first time he kissed her in the warm nook of Sullivan's, hidden by the door. He thinks of sons and grandsons and great-grandsons. He thinks of the way their hands fit together so perfectly, hers just small enough for his, pressed together like the clasps of a purse. The sun's dying moments stretch across eons, but darkness still comes in the end. He did not bring a flash lamp. He knows the grooves and struts well enough. He takes her by the hand and together they navigate the falling night. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone, I'm Demi Anter and I'm so happy to be a part of your festival this year. Of course, I would really, really love to be there in person. I haven't been to Sligo yet, but I do perform in Ireland quite often and I would have been there this year probably, if not for everything that's going on. Um, but I'm still really glad that Patrick invited me to be part of Vagabond Voices and that I get a chance to share with you from the comfort of Berlin <laughs> in my home here. So thank you so much for having me. Um, most of my knowledge of Sligo is actually informed by a particular Sally Rooney novel, so it might not be a surprise that this next piece, which is a favorite of mine, is also about a very long and difficult relationship. He asks me a lot of questions about my ex-boyfriend. Not all at once, but here and there, they peek out a smattering of curiosity. How did you meet? How old is he? And why did you break up exactly? And why did you break up now, finally, after all of these years? And why? As hard as I try, my answers never feel adequate. We met through a college professor, my mentor, your friend. You saw me do spoken word. You were too old for me, but eventually I didn't care. I was in love and I looked past it. I looked past a lot of things. I loved your brain, so I didn't mind the body that came with it, so uptight. It's not a bad body, but we never had a spark. I didn't want to fuck the shit out of you, so eventually we didn't fuck at all, and I convinced myself that this was a natural progression, that I could live with it, because a lot of other things were really good. From the outside, we were really good, and from the outset, we were the couple that everyone loved and admired and rooted for. 
me feisty and fun, you thoughtful and calm, the kind of presence at any party that attracted all of my poor young friends in need of advice. You were so nice. You are the nicest person I will ever know. Now I'm feeling a bit desperate. It's hard to explain the ins and outs of a relationship without going deep, and I don't want to overwhelm the listener with tales of the back and forth, the conflicted heart, the years of wondering why something always felt off. But when you got sick before the arcade fire show and missed it, it was a turning point. And when you refused to see a therapist, a turning point. And when your boss was a dick to me, and you still refused to quit, a turning point. It took a lot of turning points and 360 degree rotations to spin fast enough, to push hard enough, to fall out of the circle. You and I and I and you. You and I and I and you. You were a constant, content, and I miserable, but content with pretending. I could not be the girl who asked you to move your whole life to another country with no language and no job and no friends and then dump you. And when you got sick, I didn't know if you needed a mother or an ass kicker. I opted for the latter and complained to my friends, to any friend who would listen, about how stagnant we felt, how wasted I was on this unambitious man, how I loved but didn't lust, how I wanted out but didn't want to let go. It's not easy to leave someone after so many years. To think some far off day you'll want to turn to the person next to you in bed and say, remember when we were young and in Berlin? Remember the night we saw the fox on David Bowie's birthday and the street was silent and filled with snow? Remember kissing in London in front of the casino? Remember the cats and how small they used to be? Do you remember me? Do you remember me? You knew me at 8, 19, and 20, and 21, and 22, and 23, and 24, which was a fucking doozy, and 25, I spent my birthday sick in a bathtub, and you brought me breakfast, and 26, 26 is the year I decided I did not need you anymore. And now I feel I have a mark on my forehead, a red X painted thickly, a red flag spiking from my back to warn the others. She was six years gone. Six years with one person is basically a marriage without the party, so I'm basically divorced without the alimony. And I'm not sure, does that mean that I'm used up now? Or that I'm intimidating because I've seen things the others haven't. Or maybe I'm boring because I was busy building shelves and making soup while my classmates were snorting coke and fucking bartenders. Or maybe I'm scary. This is a serious girl and her blowjobs come with a price tag. Six years and two cats. Plus, she'll make you move to Berlin, then be upset when you're unemployed, have no friends, and so much anxiety you vomit on the S-Bahn. Twice. I thought I was a nurturer. I thought I was loyal. I thought I was girlfriendy. I thought I was nice. I thought I was easy to fall in love with. I thought I had an ass that I don't quit. I thought that my hair was my best feature and that my vibe, a little Bowie, a hint manic pixie was fun and even alluring. I thought I was nice, but I think that I'm nice and not nice, and that's a lose-lose, and maybe I would feel like less of a loser if I could forget, but I want to remember everything that came between us. Everything from moment one, Demi, this is Ty, until the last one, us sitting at opposite ends of the bed and you saying, so sad. I know that we're broken up now. 
I want to wake up and understand us to be able to answer why, what was the reason for any of this? How much do six years and countless good intentions add up to three million minutes? And is it enough to say that I am grateful for every stupid one of them, for every second of you and I and I and you? Thank you. The next piece that I would like to do for you is also a favorite of mine, and it's something I wrote last year, and uh, I always really enjoy hearing what people have to say about it and their own experiences with it because um, it seems to be a topic that strikes a chord with a lot of people and in different ways. Um, so feel free to <laughs> write your comments or to share your experiences if you have something to say about it as well. I won't say the title because I think it kind of gives the piece away a little bit. But here it goes. I have this video playing on a loop in my head. It's America's Next Top Model. One of the contestants has a big booty and not much up here. And Tyra tells her, it just would be nicer if the top matched the bottom if you were more proportional. This video I saw at age 13 was quickly compounded by every women's magazine. How to get that summer bod? Are you a pear or an orange? The truth about tummy tucks. When to start Botox? Leg lifts to stay toned. Michelle Obama yoga pose. Elongate that neck. Puff out your chest. Suck in your stomach. Stop breathing. Breathe only when other people aren't watching. Stop eating. High carb then low carb then no fat. It's still a diet. If you're always on a diet, I've tried it. All of it an attempt to raise my self-worth in a world where pretty is a currency and I've been told too many times he's just into really skinny girls. I've had highs and lows. A difference of 10 kilos in a matter of weeks didn't do the trick. As I lost more, he liked me less. So I know this is a sickness, but when I undress, I, depending on the day, I see either a goddess or a barrel, Beyonce or dad bod. And I nod when friends give me compliments and tell me not to complain, and I know that guys are into me, at least for an evening. In other words, I'm fuckable enough. But... An influx of one night stands adds up to alone again. And I'm wondering if my face and my charm and my interest in world politics are just not enough to make up for a shape that will never be perfect. That will never be ideal on either end of the spectrum. Not your Kate Moss, nor your Kim Kardashian. I am not a peach, a plum, a pear, or an orange. I think I might be a fruit without a name. Juicy and delicious all the same, and I am trying slowly to embrace imperfection, to not feel ashamed of Instagram selfies or going topless, praising every pixel, because self-love is a radical act when you've spent your whole life hating your body. Dear body, the truth is, if I had treated another person as I have treated you, that behavior would be called abuse. And I owe you an apology for the endless measuring up against other women with bigger busts, flatter stomachs, and shinier hair. Proportional or not, I don't care. You are sweet and sour, not a handful, but an entire orchard of boundless, shameless fruit. And what an honor it is to tend to you. Thank you. Ah, I wanted to do one last piece for you, and it's quite a new one, so I don't have it memorized yet, but I will, I will perform it from the page. And uh, for now, the title is Eyelashes. 
but let's see. Some, sometimes titles change <laughs> over time. Anyway, this is it. Eyelashes. There was a summer when my entire field of vision was taken up by your eyelashes, long and fluttering, your face as you leaned in to kiss me. I felt myself blossom under your gaze. I struggled to remember everything that came before. This body and all of its years of experiences I carry with me a desert in California, bougainvillea flowers, raging magenta, honeysuckle blossoms we bit the ends off as kids, yellow and sweet, rollerblades on hot cement, knee pads, and sunstroke and sweat, shielded eyes, my mom's Pfizer collection on hikes through the mountains, rest houses with facts about Desert tortoise, desert wildflower bloom, desert oasis we never quite made it to, mirages and did they or didn't they exist after all, jumps off of rock piles into spring water and kissing boys in pools, splashing under palm trees and snorting chlorine, laughing, followed by screaming matches in parking lots. Buttons up the back undone. First, I love yous. First, drives into Utah, Colorado, red rocks, blue ocean, salt hair, tangled waves I thought would drown me. Losses I thought would drown me. Butter melting, hot bread sizzling, smoking, dancing, throwing, shouting, moaning, rowing, swimming, floating, wandering. I went wandering and I ended up here so I could unfold myself and all of these 28 years unzip at the throat and expose to you all of it. I wanted you to have all of it. I wanted you to touch everywhere, all of the places I've been, all of the sunlight I've seen. I wanted to sway at the pleasure of light warming the skin. And you, I can see you that summer when my entire field of vision was taken up by your eyelashes, long and fluttering, your face as you kissed me. You felt as good as the sun on my skin. And I wanted you to feel it too. Thank you so much again, everyone, for tuning in. And thank you, Patrick, for organizing this event and everyone else involved in the festival. I really appreciate taking part and can't wait to see what other things are in store. If you want to check out my work or keep in touch or see when I actually will be <laughs> performing in Ireland again one day, hopefully. Uh, you can find everything on my website, which is just Demi, D-E-M-I, Anter, A-N-T-E-R, DemiAnter.com. Thanks so much. I'm Frankie Elliott. I'm a writer from Los Angeles. I would much rather be in Ireland right now, but I am honored to be a part of this festival. I am the author of three books, and they're mostly poetry and short stories. They um, often, I'm often referred to as Bukowski with a skirt, so you can kind of get an idea of my writing style. I am actually going to read you a story that was published in Vice for Pride um, a couple of summers ago, and it's about living in a very conservative part of the United States growing up, and having a gay mother and she also struggled with addiction. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start it. It's called Things I Can't Ask My Mother. My older siblings never told me about my mother proposing to her girlfriend when I was 10 years old. And I guess that I never asked. A few Thanksgivings ago, my mother said, wait, you've never heard this story? Let me tell you. She said it was more like a fight the way that she proposed 
well, are you gonna marry me or not? I admired her confidence, so they got married, as much as a lesbian couple could while living in Chicago in the 1990s. A slip of paper, two gold bands, it doesn't mean much, she said and shrugged. At first, their wedding was all planned out, visions of grandeur, but everything ended up being too expensive and neither of them had money. So they did it on a whim. It was Pride Weekend in Chicago, my mother told me. We had a small ceremony with eight other couples. As she spoke, I envisioned grocery store cake and flowers and hugs and laughter. They didn't have champagne or drinks. Of course they didn't. They had met in rehab. Or did they meet in the halfway house that my mother ended up in after detox? That's another thing that I wasn't sure of, how they met. Nobody was invited to the ceremony other than my combat boots wearing sister, the only of us five siblings to grow up with her. My father had kicked her out for shaving her head and bringing another girl to prom in high school. This was a move that was so bold in our small Indiana town that I got shit for it a decade later when I, be, when I became a freshman. Well, I said to my mother, you should do it again. Renew your vows, an anniversary, have a party so that all your friends and family can celebrate. I imagined myself throwing them a party. I'd never done a single thing ever for my mother. Maybe this could be it. After all, I barely knew her. Well, I barely know her. We're still alive and moving. But she threw her hands up, looked at her partner and said, Psh, she'd never do it. Her girlfriend of 25 plus years didn't deny it. For most of my childhood, I had no idea that my mother was gay. Even though she shared a bedroom with her roommate in her two bedroom apartment, even though there was a giant rainbow banner hanging in the shared bedroom with pink triangles decorating it, even though they had a purple truck, even though she took us sporadically to a non-denominational church where I once watched two stunning drag queens perform the vagina monologues at the annual spaghetti dinner. And then there was this photo of them almost kissing on the shelf in their living room. I studied it a lot, wondering what it meant. Nobody told me as a child. I just accepted my surroundings. Sometime in middle school, it dawned on me. My mother is gay. This is her girlfriend, her partner. This is her wife, but not really, not legally. I never said it out loud to anyone, and no one said it out loud to me, but I knew. The 90s were a weird time to grow up with a gay mother. I had never met anyone like me, and it wasn't something you saw on TV like today, where families are now purposely diversified. This was right around when Ellen DeGeneres simultaneously made pop culture history and sidetracked her career by coming out on her own sitcom. Laura Dern, who played her love interest, couldn't get a job for a year in Hollywood after kissing her on air. Even Oprah got backlash just for inviting Ellen onto her show to explain to angry viewers that it's okay to be gay. When I realized my mother was gay, I wasn't ashamed but I did have an overwhelming sense that I had to keep it to myself. My combat boots wearing sister, she had always referred to my mother and her partner as her moms. I grew up with my father, so it felt different than me. Instead of having two moms, I felt that I had zero. Two women that we saw sometimes and ate cheesecake with. Two women who occasionally took us to the zoo or a baseball game. When I was lucky, others filled her role for me. My grandmother, my older sisters, a revolving door of housekeepers, the well-meaning mother of my friends, the well-meaning mothers of my friends. I'll never forget how my friends took for granted those well-meaning mothers of theirs and how lucky they were to have them. I've tried to write this story a million times, but it's so complicated, so fuzzy. I was five the day that my mother left. She piled her children into a van and drove across town. I remember this perfectly though. She parked in front of a plain brown apartment and said, this is my new home. I've told this story to fewer than six people and now I'm telling it to you. 
this is my new home. I can't imagine what that drive felt like for her. Her children in her car, the younger ones mostly clueless. Did that drive last a thousand years? What was she thinking? Did she cry? Did she turn on the radio to distract herself? I was too young to know that my mother had been struggling with addiction her whole life. Too young to know that she'd been slowly moving into that apartment for months now, plotting to break the news to my father at one of her therapy sessions. In the end, they got in a fight and she stormed out, telling my oldest sister to let him know that she was leaving for good. What a terrible thing to put on a 17 year old, she recalled once to me in a letter. The reason we were in that van in front of my mother's new home was because she had finally chosen to get clean and get her life together. In the process of finding sobriety, her therapist began to lightly suggest that she might be a lesbian. But my mother protested that idea for a long time. She said that was an impossible concept to grasp. There was no such thing in her world. I don't remember going inside of her brown apartment building that day but I remember the drive back to our house. We returned to our cul-de-sac in our cushy Indiana neighborhood. My brother and I, we didn't stop crying for hours. He ate an entire box of Oreos and threw up all over the bed. I stayed in the living room and I watched the street from the front window, waiting for her to come back. Sometimes I feel like I'm still waiting. My mother surprised me with a photo album the day that she told me her proposal story. This is from our ceremony. The photos were very, very 90s. I was shocked to see that her girlfriend had chosen pink leggings and a black overcoat as her wedding dress. She was radiant. Her shiny blonde hair fell down to her waist. Still somewhat traditional, my mother was more of the groom with khaki slacks, a white button down shirt, and a seafoam cummerbund. The smile on my mother's face, the look in their eyes, it was like no other. I studied the photos for a long time. I thought about what 20 years could do to a couple. I thought about her blood running through me and what that meant. I sometimes worry that all I've inherited from my mother is her sadness, her insecurity, her irrational fears, her inability to really be close to someone. I don't need anyone and nobody needs me. That was the unspoken lesson I learned from my mother growing up. I put the wedding album down and I looked at the two of them before me, my two mothers, with their matching pullover sweaters. Hers was navy, hers was gray. Their white sneakers from a discount store. The red puffy coats that they got in the mail from cashing in cigarette buck bucks. I wonder what being together meant to them now. Did my mother figure it all out? Were they still in love? Or were they just going through the motions? Was the uphill climb worth it? These are questions that I can never ask her. Last year I was at a cocktail party when I became enamored with an elegant older woman and her handsome husband. The energy between them felt like lightning the energy between them felt like lightning bugs in a jar on a hot summer night. Like a flower coming up through a crack in the sidewalk. I asked the woman quite seriously, how do you stay in love with somebody for so long? I had just broken up with my boyfriend and I was positive that I would never fall in love again. I thought it was a miracle that someone loved me to begin with, even if that someone was a shitty person. The elegant woman left me, walked around the party exchanging pleasantries with, uh, with all of the other guests and I had almost forgotten about her. At the end of the evening, she returned to me and said, I have the answer to your question. She leaned into my ear and whispered, choose wisely. When I was six or seven, my mother filed for legal separation from my father and there was a custody battle. When I was six or seven, my mother filed for legal separation from my father and there was a custody battle. He's never spoken to me about it, but I can only guess that he was bitter and shell-shocked to be left for another woman. Legend has it that he disappeared into a mental institution for a week and came back with small coin purses and keychains 
that he had sewn for us in art therapy while there. At least that's what one of my sisters told me. She vividly remembers those coin purses. I was so young that I've made her memory my own. That happens with siblings. You stitch the past together for each other. When I think of those coin purses, I feel embarrassed, desperately sad for my father. I thought at the time that he had gone on vacation to Mexico. Who told me that he'd gone on vacation to Mexico? Another story I heard was that my father's lawyer strategically moved the custody hearing to a court in a small Indiana town with a super conservative judge. My mother's lawyer told her not to even bother showing up. She was a recovering al alcoholic, a drug addict, and homosexual. On paper, my father was the right choice, an educated white man, a doctor. In reality, he was abusive, absent. He was someone we were afraid of. He left his blank prescription pads around the house for years for her. Those prescription pads were like a message to my mother. They said, you're not strong enough to leave me. You're not strong enough to get clean. Her lawyer was right. She wasn't granted shared custody. She was allowed limited supervised visits with her children. Supervised because the judge unofficially ruled that we are unsafe with her due to her drug alcohol abuse and her sexuality. I don't know my mother well, but I do know that if she were there that day, she would have told the judge to fuck off. I still wanna go into the courtroom and tell that judge to fuck off. How different would life have been if we had a less homophobic judge, a less cruel father? Who would I be now? Who would my mother be? Instead of being angry at the judge, my mother felt defeated. She didn't feel she deserved her kids and now the court ruled that she didn't either. I don't know how she didn't start drinking again. There are two conflicting things that I know about my mother. One is that she would do anything for her children. One time when I was a toddler, I somehow broke my arm. The doctor leaned in to examine me and without warning, he pulled my arm hard to reset it. I screamed so loud that my mother punched him. Another time, my brother was fussing with his food at dinner and my father got mad and knocked him off of his chair. As he walked away, my mother totally lost it. She jumped on his back and held a knife to him. He shouted, are you crazy? As, she pushed, as he pushed her away. I guess I was, she later wrote to me, but she said her therapist assured her that she was just being a mother. The other thing that I know about my mother is that she ran. She would write vague notes and disappear, leaving the family frantic. She'd drive as far as she could usually somewhere around Indianapolis, a couple of hours away. She never had a plan and she didn't even bring money. Every time she realized that she couldn't escape herself. Eventually she'd run out of gas, get on a payphone and call home, asking for the credit card number so that she could buy gas to come back. Maybe that was the problem with my mother. She was always fighting for and running from her children at the same time always coming and going, her absence just as strong as her presence. I don't have many childhood photos, but what I do have are three photo albums of pictures all from the same day. All of my siblings are on the porch of our house that was no longer my mother's house. Back then, a photo album was a real investment, a real effort. You had to buy the film, you had to drop it off and wait for it to be de developed, which wasn't cheap, by the way. Then you were stuck with whatever blurry photos you got back. <clears throat> you got back and pasted them into a book to give to someone. I don't know how, but I ended up with all three brown books generically titled photo album in faded calligraphy. My siblings and I look muted in the photos, forced and awkward. I remember my sisters refusing to smile for the camera. I'm wearing Hawaiian shorts and a Minnie Mouse shirt, my bangs trimmed crookedly, my feet bare like a lazy kid. I remember my mother waving with a cigarette in her hand, leaning against my grandmother's olive car. I remember her smile. 
how well it hid such a heavy heart. My brother later told me that that was the first day she got to see us after the custody battle, her first supervised visit. That's why there were so many photos. Somewhere down the line, the custody agreement changed. When we got to visit her more regularly, my mother was still shaken up. She had started her new life as a gay, sober woman. She was figuring out how that made sense with being a mother. She once told me that she always wanted a dozen children because she wanted to treat them better than she was treated as a child by her own alcoholic father and absent mother. She wondered about her choices and if they were worth it. Her choice was both simple and difficult. Leave her children by dying of an overdose or leave her children to get sober. What I think she didn't expect was that the one thing she could never recover from was her guilt. Her guilt had been a thick wall between us my entire life. A wall that left me on my own, wondering about my own self-worth since I was five years old. When we visited her in that brown apartment, she'd forget how to act around her own kids. She bought a parakeet with yellow feathers, thinking it would lighten the mood. The parakeet died a week after that. My mother later told me she thought to herself, how can I take care of these children? I can't even keep a bird alive. A few months after she moved away from my father, my mother relapsed in that same apartment that was meant to save her. She stopped going to work, where she prided herself on being a drug counselor while abusing drugs. Sick thinking is how she described it once to me in a letter. She had learned how to drink while taking antabuse, a drug that is designed to make you very ill when combined with alcohol. A colleague or friend found her at home drunk and sent her to detox. On Thanksgiving of all days, with no place to call home and no paycheck, my mother was forced to move into a halfway house in Chicago, where she was watched 24 seven. She stayed clean though, and I learned that this was where she met her girlfriend, her partner, her now wife. Somehow, she had climbed from rock bottom to in love, but with my poor mother, nothing was ever easy. When the halfway house found out about their relationship, they were kicked out. All they had was an air mattress, borrowed money, and each other when they were thrown onto the street. A few years ago, gay marriage was legalized in Indiana and then the rest of the country. Even though my relationship with my, ne my mother never turned out the way either of us would have hoped, I cried and I cried that morning as my social media was flooded with excitement. Hashtag love wins. I felt proud for her. I felt proud for everyone. I thought of my best friend in high school who came out of the closet on prom night, how he struggled in, in high school and college making friends because of his, his sexuality, how he got harassed on the street and in class, how people treated him like he wasn't a real person. He overdosed a couple of years later. His father killed himself 10 years after that because of grief. I wish they could have seen how far we've come. A woman from my hometown named Nikki Kwasny and her partner, Amy Sandler, are a major part of the reason that gay marriage was legalized in Indiana. Nikki was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and before she died, she wanted to be sure that her partner could be listed on her death certificate as her spouse, whom she had married in Massachusetts. She wanted to know that her wife and children would be recognized as her family and receive the same benefits as anyone else. She fought tooth and nail, never giving up, to try to force Indiana to recognize her marriage. Mike Pence, who was the governor of the state at the time, fought just as hard to stop them. It wasn't until she was gravely ill, about to die, that a federal judge finally granted her emergency request to have her marriage legally recognized. Nikki passed away less than a year later, a hero to us all. Marriage was legalized in the same state that had once suggested that my mother was dangerous to her children for being gay. 
Soon after, my mother and her girlfriend were officially married. I didn't get to throw them a celebration or a party. My combat boots wearing sister, all grown up into a beautiful woman, she didn't get to act as their witness. In fact, they didn't even tell us about it. I don't know if it was like any other day or how the conversation went when they decided to officiate their relationship. I found out through a text message. That's how my mother delivers any news, good or bad. Deaths, happy birthdays, heart surgery, grandma's in the hospital, the dog is dying, it's always a text message. The text was a photograph of her marriage certificate. I later found out that they were surprised when the old man who issued the certificate apologized and said it was a travesty that they had to wait so long. The bar had been so low for them. They weren't used to apologies and kindness and acceptance. There was no dressing up for them this time, no photographer of them, no photographer to take photos of them together, no cake, no ceremony. The text didn't even say anything else, but I could imagine my mother waving an arm, casually brushing it aside. It doesn't mean much, a slip of paper, two rings. My mother's name was signed where the word groom had been whited out, as if to erase all past injustices. Finally, the law accepted her as the woman she always was with the woman she loved, and she could be a mother too. That slip of paper actually meant everything, not just for them, but for us children, now adults, now able to see the bigger picture. We had proof that despite everything that we had been through and that she had been through, we had made it out okay. And though the battle was long and hard, my mother had chosen wisely after all. Thank you. Once again, I'm Frankie Elliott, F-R-A-N-K-I-E-L-L-I-O-T. And um, my books, my first book is called Piano Rats. It's a short poetry book that I wrote in my early 20s. Um, it's a little devastating and um, kind of edgy. And then my second book is called Kiss As Many Women As You Can, which is a, a beautiful art book, it's postcards with poetry writ written on typewriter, written on a typewriter. And my most recent book is called Stories for People Who Hate Love. And um, it's a little bit longer, a little bit um, edgier, vulnerable. Um, it's really good. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I wrote it. Um, I'm, really, I'm really proud of it. So um, it, I recommend checking out my books if you like my story. So thank you so much. and. Um, thank you for having me on this festival.